Hallo und herzlich willkommen zu einer neuen Folge des Nachher-Podcasts vom Nachhaltigkeitsbüro der HU. Heute wieder mit dem neuesten Vortrag aus unserer Ringvorlesungsreihe Der grüne Faden. Viel Spaß beim Zuhören. And I think, um, from my understanding, many of you come from different disciplines, and I think this is also a very nice basis for us then to have a nice discussion later about the topic. And I'm sure many of you have already heard um, about the linkages between climate change, environmental uh, changes, and, and uh, human mobility. And it's also a topic which is quite timely and has received a lot of attention. And this is also how I would like to start my presentation today. I have brought you a number of news reports from the last years uh, where you can see how the media has reported about the topic of environmental migration, environmental displacement. And what you can see here is on one side that it has received quite a bit of attention also from major media outlets, but that often the headlines are rather simplistic ones that are emphasizing um, the number of people that are potentially going to be displaced because of climate change, the number of people that might potentially migrate, for example, to Europe. And today I would like to show you that the topic is in many ways much more complex than what we see in these media headlines. And there's much more um, things that we need to take into account, much more aspects that we need to into take into account to fully understand what really climate uh, mobility, um, as I will be referring to it, um, really means. And I also argue for a more human-centered uh, perspective in this debate, a, uh, a perspective that takes a closer focus on the needs um, and capabilities of the humans, um, including migrants um, that are affected by climate change, as I believe this is really something that is urgently needed in the current debates. So for the talk today, I would like uh, to follow the following outline. At the beginning, I would briefly like to talk about the general links between climate change, climate change impacts and population. So in what to what extent is, is climate change really of relevance for populations and where are impacts um, felt? Then I would like to provide you a brief overview of the topic of climate mobility, that is any form of, of movement due to um, climatic events or environmental change processes, and also introduce you to some central concepts in the literature. Before I will then move on to present some stylized findings and estimates um, also from previous studies. Um, in section four, I will highlight uh, some more complexities of the whole topic. And this is really something that I have already said before. So when we talk about the links between climate, environment and mobility outcomes, this is truly a very complex topic. And I will highlight here why this is the case and why we often see very diverse, diverse forms of mobility um, if there is an environmental event and also other responses um, um, and to, to, to environmental change processes. And then I would like to conclude very briefly with some implications and a discussion of the relevance of the whole topic for policy. Starting with um, some general remarks on the role of climate impacts and populations, um, I guess it is needless to say, but I've still included it. Um, you all know that the human influence has had a major impact on the climate and we have seen in the past decades really an unprecedented uh, warming trend that has been uh, unprecedented for the last uh, 2,000 years, um, where the anthropogenic influence is clearly visible. And these impacts are also going to continue to influence our world under most of the scenarios that we have to, to basically calculate future impacts of climate change. Um, a future warming trend is expected unless there is really an immediate reduction in emissions. Um, and as we have seen uh, now from the COP26, um, there's still a bit of a way to go um, to really achieve the climate targets that the world has set. These changes in, in warming, they have really major impacts on, on the world and our climate system, um, and also local impacts on the, the different regions of the world. What is important here is that the world is not uh, uniformly affected by these global changes in the climatic conditions, but different regions are differently affected why the temperature increases um, we currently observe. I have brought you here um, three um, illustrations from the um, last uh, IPCC report, where you can clearly see that some areas of the world, and it's often areas that already are characterized by quite um, dire um, environmental conditions, 
are the ones to experience um, the harshest uh, changes in, in temperatures and then also related hazards. Um, what is also um, important here is to see that we can really still um, make a difference um, globally also by capping the warming, for example, to 1.5 degrees. So the world we are looking at uh, would be a very different one um, depending on what uh, pathway we are going to take in terms of future warming. Um, so each and every degree and, and uh, this degree really matters here. In some region, regions, the impacts of climate change may be so strong that limits to adaptation may be reached where the risks and losses due to climate impacts may rise to intolerable levels. That is levels where local populations um, can no longer sustain the livelihoods or the existences. And this is, of course, the moment then when um, also mobility becomes very relevant because in these cases, migrating away from those areas might be the only um, suitable survival strategy for those people. Depending on which geogra geographical region we look at, climate change can have very, very different impacts um, on the local level. We here look at, for example, differences in, uh, for example, impacts such as rising sea levels of flooding, heat and, and drought events, uh, impacts due to wind and erosion, storms and heavy rainfall, and forest fires, such as we have seen them uh, in, the, in, the, in the US in the past years, and also loss of biodiversity. All of these differential impacts can have, in turn, effect, can have an effect on, on human systems, and then in turn also affect mobility patterns and how and how exactly we will take a closer look at this in a, in a moment. What I wanted to, to show you here is that these impacts of climate change, um, even though we see some differences between regions, they are truly global. So that's really a global issue. Um, and this is also the answer to one of the statements that I've given you. There is no region in the world that will not be affected and is not already affected by climate change and its impacts. And you see that these impacts range from diverse, um, basically affect differential sectors, um, such as, uh, such as, uh, such as uh, uh, the biological um, um, system that is here depicted in, in, in green, that is impacts that are highlighted in green in this graph that I've also taken from the, uh, not the last, but the previous IPCC report, and also impacts on, on human systems, which are highlighted here in, in red. And you see quite a diversity in the impact. And depending on what the impacts are, we see also differential impacts on populations. And this is quite important when it comes to understanding then the links to human mobility, because each and every uh, if, uh, if dif different effect on different systems um, can have different implications and ramifications for, for how people um, move, migrate, or are forced to, to, to leave their homes. I wanted to illustrate that with an example here from Peru that I've taken from research from one of my uh, colleagues, Jonas Bergmann, um, who has done a lot of work on the linkages between uh, climate change and migration in Peru. He has also prepared an assessment report for IOM on climate change and migration in Peru. And uh, I have taken here two pictures from Peru where you can see that uh, the impacts and consequences of climate change can have very different, um, different, uh, different uh, effects depending on also where you are. So the top picture is from the mountainous regions of Peru. So those of you who are familiar with the country, Peru, as a coastline, um, some plains coastline, and uh, and some highlands, and then some rainforest uh, regions. So this is like the three major uh, uh, zones that you can find in Peru. For people who are living in the mountains in Peru, the big challenge in the future will be that they are facing um, water scarcity, um, mainly because of the um, uh, melting of the glaciers. So many of the communities in the mountains in Peru, they retrieve their drinking water and also the water they use for irrig irrigation and agricultural activities. They take it from the um, uh, flows and streams that come from the glaciers. And these are slowly melting, putting really a high pressure on water security in these areas. At the same time, we see in Peru um, increased flooding risks in the plains with some major floods occurring in the past years. 
where people were forcefully displaced from their homes because um, there was uh, basically too much water, too much uh, rainfall and resulting um, flooding. So here you see that in the same country, we have really this um, paradox um, um, paradox impacts that you have on one side in one area, too, too much water and the other area in the mountains, too little water, highlighting really the diversity of the impacts on populations. Climate impacts are of relevance for various aspects of human systems for various um, issues related to our livelihoods. I have um, here displayed uh, the sustainable development goals to highlight that really climate change can potentially have an impact on many of these uh, goals and might in fact already today um, put um, the achievement of some of these goals at risk. Um, I'm just mentioning a few, for example, um, risk related to increasing poverty, of course, food security, health, um, access to, to clean energy, uh, clean water and sanitation, um, working conditions, and of course, also livelihoods in, in cities and communities. And this is just a few of them. What is important when we talk about climate impacts on populations is that it's not just natural forces that basically influence populations, but it's always an interplay between socioeconomic pro processes on one side, which you see here depicted on the right-hand side, and natural forces on the left-hand side that together determine the risk that a, a household or a community is exposed to or faces. So especially like social and economic processes, they are relevant, for example, in influencing whether households are exposed to hazards and, of course, also to what extent they are vulnerable, that is susceptible to the influence of these hazards. And also when we talk about whether households migrate um, once they are um, facing environmental hazards. This question is, of course, very important. And um, to what extent are they exposed and also vulnerable to these influences? And to what extent does that force them to leave their homes or not? Which brings me to um, the main uh, topic of today, um, the topic of climate mobility. I would like to start with a brief overview of, the, of, the, of this concept. So climate mobility, we understand as any form of mobility that occurs as a direct or indirect consequence of climatic or environmentally, environmental more broadly influences. This can be both sudden onset or gradual processes. So that sudden onset is like a disaster that, that occurs, whereas gradual processes are slow onset events that um, unfold um, their de devastating uh, potential over a longer time horizon. What is important here, and this is answering uh, to one of the other statements that I've given you before, moving away from inhabitable and dangerous regions has really been a survival strategy at all times of human history. So we find analogs to climate mobilities that we see today in many um, parts of our human history. Um, it's really an anthropological constant, if you want. Um, here to the right, I've brought you a picture from the so-called US Dust Bowl migration. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this. So as I said, often environmental impacts can be one of the reasons why people decide to move away from an affected area. But in most cases, what we also see in empirical studies is that it's really a, a, a mixture of different causes, which are often very closely related to each other. And we will talk about this also in a moment. I wanted to give you a brief overview of how this concept of climate mobility has evolved over time. Here I brought you um, a, a, a table from a, from a historical overview of this um, I've given you the, 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 the site, the, the, the source uh, at the bottom, where you see how, how this uh, concept of, of environmentally induced mobility or migration has evolved over time. What is interesting is that already early migration theories, um, such as by Ravenstein, for example, have emphasized the role of the environment for migration processes. And then this idea that environmental change processes can influence migration has gotten a little bit lost and only came back into the literature in the middle of the last century, um, mainly against the background um, as the environment is being uh, seen as, a, as a, a minor reason for migration. You also see this here in the terminology used at the beginning, they were very much referring to environmentally induced migration as a, as a primitive form of migration. And only then in the 1980s and 1990s, and this has gradually started to change um, also um, um, when we were more and more facing the consequences of climate change, of course, 
um, where we now start to really um, shift more our focus on the issue of, 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 of environmental change and, and human mobilities. What we see is that already today in many regions of the world, changes in environmental and climatic conditions are closely linked to migration dynamics and different other forms of human mobility. Um, I have brought you here um, a figure from one of our recent publications uh, where we looked into the relationship between different uh, processes of environmental changes at the bottom part. And then um, at the top part, this is the, uh, the trend lines, uh, different mobility outcomes um, where we could show that in different parts of the world, we see um, relationships um, between the two factors, uh, the two variables. Um, but what we also saw is that the strength and the direction of the relationship very much depended on local conditions and, of course, also the type and intensity of the experienced environmental influences. So there is truly no automatism in, at play um, when we talk about the linkages between environmental change and mobility. Um, not everyone also who is affected will migrate and I will show you more about this later. Before that, I would like to briefly highlight that when I talk about mobility and climate mobility, then I basically talk about very diverse forms of, of um, mobility that mobility can take. And actually, there is not one form of climate mobility at the end of the day. <clears throat> mobility can be temporary or permanent. It can be short distance or long distance. It can be within a country that is internal migration or international. It can be circular or linear and different other forms. So we have really a multiplicity of different um, forms that uh, mobilities can take. And this puts also us researchers as well as policymakers and practitioners. Uh, to, it, it gives us many challenges, of course, in, when it comes to measuring uh, mobility outcomes, when it comes to uh, predicting uh, mobility in the future and so on. Important distinction is uh, the one between migration, displacement, and then also relocation. So um, when I talk about climate mobility, I'm referring basically to different forms of movements um, that um, includes all of these three mentioned ones here. When we talk about migration, we speak of either temporarily or permanently uh, resettlements, that is spatial movements, that can be either forced or voluntarily. So with migration, it doesn't make really a difference if people were initially forced um, to move or decided by themselves voluntarily. What is important is that they relocate to a different location. When we talk about displacement, on the other hand, we have um, basically only forced movements in mind that result from a specific hazard. Um, typically, these are rather short-term moves, short-distance moves, where also people tend to return back to their um, home locations in many cases. So this distinction between migration and displacement is quite common because it's often also confused then um, in, in the public debates. Um, of course, displacement can result um, or can be migration if people stay in the um, destination areas where they migrated to. Relocation, which I will not uh, touch upon so much here, that refers to any planned or assisted um, form of mobility, um, for example, if a, hazard, uh, if, if a hazard might occur, then governments might decide to, 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 to relocate population. Um, and this also does not necessarily have to be voluntarily. So that's also quite interesting. Um, there's interesting research about this as well, that, of course, some population might not want to be relocated. And the success of such relocation programs very much depends um, on involving uh, the communities that are to be relocated and taking them on board to really um, basically have also their um, decision power in this. Um, we typically distinguish um, or describe climate mobility along a continuum, um, where on one side you have more forced forms of displacement that result from unforeseen rapid events where people have very low levels of control and are, of course, very vulnerable. And on the other side, more voluntary forms of migration where people have greater control over the process and often where the basically migration is used rather as a preventive strategy, um, as a potentially adaptive strategy to environmental change processes uh, and not so much as a, as a, as a measure of last resort. So this is also why you see um, the voluntary migration rather 
as a response to more long-term gradually unfolding environmental threats, whereas forced displacement is more common with rapid onset events and catastrophes. The decision to migrate or to move is at the end an outcome of complex interactions between both contextual influences and individual factors that shape whether a household or an individual um, decides or can afford um, to leave the home. And uh, the environment, um, climatic factors are just one of many factors that play a role here. So it's really an interplay um, of many different um, aspects and factors that, that shape um, mobility outcomes. And this is also what makes this field for research quite interesting, but also quite challenging. Because for us, um, basically identifying in which areas, which of these factors is most relevant, and then using it, for example, to predict um, out-migration from an area in the future, that is not so easy because these factors can very strongly vary depending on what uh, respective context we look at. Climate change, to make it even more complex, climate change can not only affect mobility directly, for example, by representing an immediate threat for populations or undermining um, immediately the livelihoods of populations, but it can also affect mobility outcomes indirectly. So, for example, by undermining economic, um, economic, uh, the economic or political or social systems that then in turn lead, for example, to increased uh, migration. So I've given you a few examples here. Um, for example, um, a depletion of resources that can gradually lead um, to, to, to increased pressures on populations, increased livelihood risks, and then um, forces people to move out. Um, but the actual climate signal might already um, might, might, might not be so strongly visible in this case. Or imagine a, a, a rapid onset a disaster event that then has uh, ramifications for local societies, um, which then in turn leads to, to greater mobility uh, from that area. Um, we would still have an impact here from, um, from the environmental side, but, um, but it is an indirect one. When it comes to our scientific knowledge from our scientific literature, then tentatively we have a better knowledge about the direct impacts of um, environmental events and also climatic changes in areas on, on migration compared to um, the indirect ones, simply because there's such an enormous complexity involved in understanding how these different um, potential channels uh, can influence mobility outcomes in different contexts. I brought you one example here. Um, with uh, conflicts um, to also once more make the point that climatic changes alone are really the only reason for migration, um, but that they can indirectly be related or also exacerbate the consequences of other drivers. So conflict is an interesting um, uh, mechanism or channel to look at. And I'm sure many of you have heard about uh, discussions about how climate change can fuel conflicts, which then in turn can uh, result in, in migration. And there is now um, an in ever growing uh, literature that, that shows really that there is linkages, but again, not in all cases, not in all contexts, and which is also partly related to the complexity of the different relationships and um, channels um, of influence. So I've depicted here one possible chain of influence that you could think of um, how conflict could come into play when we talk about this climate environment and migration nexus, um, for example, we could see in some area um, a drought um, resulting in increased food insecurity um, that if it's meet, met with low adaptive capacity might lead to a conflict over scarce resources, which then may trigger out migration from an, from an area. Um, at the same time, um, here, of course, the question is then what is the cause now for the, for the migration? Is it really the, the, the conflict, let's say the immediate cause, or is it the climate as the, as, uh, as the maybe um, the, the underlying cause of the conflict? Um, and if you, if you look deeper into this, it could also be um, that climate has an effect. Um, the links are, could also be different in a way that climate affects first migration, for example, um, by undermining, let's say, the livelihood of people. People have to move out which can then lead to, for example, to conflict in, in destination areas. And what we see in some parts of the world where, um, for example, pastoralists are changing um, their, uh, their, their, their herding behaviors and their herding routes and increasingly um, inter, interfere with, with farmers' lands. 
and uh, and this leads them to a conflict um, in 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 those uh, areas that are um, either on the um, way of the of the herders or uh, the destinations of the of the of the of the nomads. So you see that conflict. Um, there's there's multiple linkages through which uh, conflicts come into play here, and uh, definitely a relevant uh, source. But again, just to remind you of that, the underlying socioeconomic and sociopolitical conditions in an area play a very very important role here. If um, a conflict, for example, breaks up, if um, deterioration of resources lead to conflict and so on, so there is more to the picture than just um, the simple environmental factor um, behind it. I wanted to give you a few uh, stylized findings and estimates from the literature so that you can get a better understanding also about um, the extent of, of, of environmental migration worldwide and, and what we're actually referring to or what, what, what patterns we observe empirically. So here's a summary of some key findings from the literature. So when we talk about environmental mobility, then we primarily talk about internal or regional mobility. So in the rarest cases, um, people really migrate across the, the borders of the country. So this was one of the other statements that I've given you. Um, and this is also one of the main misperceptions, maybe when we talk about uh, climate change and migration, that many people um, then um, have this image in mind that, that large waves of refugees might be coming in the future. But in fact, this uh, is rather an issue um, for, for, for the regions of, of origin of the people, because most of the people remain within their regions of origin um, or within the borders of the country. And um, many migrants move from rural areas to urban centers. So um, you might be aware that many cities have seen really a rapid urban growth in the past years, which of course puts a lot of pressure on um, the urban environments and also um, for example, urban uh, labor markets and so on, infrastructures and so on. Migration typically is a household decision. So it's not a decision that is typically made by an individual, but often um, made um, by an entire household. And what we often see as a, as a pattern is that then only few members of households migrate, especially when it comes to more gradual impacts of environmental changes. Then one can see that gradually people start out-migrating um, in a form that households start sending few of their members, for example, to close by cities or um, urban centers in the countries. Typically, it's younger unmarried individuals um, without property and without um, obligations that are the ones to migrate. Um, and uh, it's typically, in many parts of the world, we see that it's more men who are changing their migration behavior as a response to environmental hazards or environmental changes, but this is not universal. So there's also some very interesting research uh, from the past years that shows that this is really very strongly influenced by cultural um, uh, patterns, characteristics of the areas uh, where people are migrating from. Um, I've recently heard a presentation uh, from Nepal where um, the speaker was uh, um, referring to um, changes in, in marriage migration of women in Nepal. So we see also, depending on the local context, um, differences in these, in these patterns. What is uh, important in all cases is uh, social networks. So we see a very important role of social networks in destination origin regions that really play a key role in shaping mobility outcomes and migration processes. An important uh, pull factor for migrants is, of course, alternative income earning opportunities. So households, by sending migrants, for example, to other areas, um, attempt, in, in some cases, if it's not displacement, if it's proper migration, um, to uh, in some cases to diversify um, the income sources, to have other income sources uh, in addition to, for example, agricultural income that then allows them also to better cope with uh, shocks in the future. And uh, just to reiterate that, as I said before, truly migration can only be understood against the background of local socioeconomic, cultural and political contexts that very much shape um, the outcomes of, of, of mobility and also the risks and challenges faced um, for migrants and their families. Here I have brought a figure from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, um, which shows um, 
the number of new displacements, um, both uh, due to conflict and um, environmental hazards in the year 2020. Um, the conflict displacements in these pie charts are um, highlighted in orange. The ones to, due to environmental causes are the ones in blue. And what you can see maybe from here is that um, the largest um, share of um, displacements due to environmental hazards is actually not in Africa, but in Asia. So we truly see, we really see that, that most people um, who get displaced um, every year is in South Asia or Southeast Asia. So here we see the, the, the main impact uh, on, on displacement. That also holds when you correct uh, for, the, for the larger population sizes in these areas. Um, what you also see is that, and um, while we see that in some regions, conflict are really the main driver of, uh, of displacement, and we see that overall, globally, it is still um, the majority of displacements are due to environmental hazards. Um, it's about, so the statement that I gave you before that conflicts in war are responsible for three times as many displacements as environmental causes, it's exactly the opposite. So on average, over the past uh, years, um, it's usually three times as many people that are displaced uh, due to environmental uh, hazards compared to conflicts and war, um, which is, uh, which is uh, shocking both for the sheer number of, of people that are displaced, but also for, given the fact that often these people do not really have um, a strong reflection, for example, in our public debates and are not very visible in our public debates if you compare it, for example, to displacement due to uh, conflict and wars that are, of course, also um, horrible. Here I've given you um, a breakdown of the number of displacements in 2020, um, where you can see to the right the displacements that occurred due to environmental hazards um, split up in geophysical and weather-related hazards, so weather-related, the ones that are more closely affected by, uh, by climatic changes. And here, if you move a little bit more to the right, uh, you can see that floods and storms are really the two primary causes of, uh, of displacements that we see um, among the environmental hazards. Um, so these two, um, depending on the year, they change usually, uh, can change the position. So when you uh, voted uh, floods, where, when, you, when we talked about the statements before, um, and, you, and you thought that floods were the primary reason, so they are definitely one of the, one of the primary reasons, so you were also right here. Um, so they account for about um, almost, yeah, storms and floods almost account for the entire share of weather-related displacements that we see globally. The question here is, of course, and we can discuss this um, in greater detail later, is, of course, how reliable is the data? So you see, for example, here at the bottom part, you see that um, the IDMC claims, excuse me, um, that only 32,000 uh, people or displacements were recorded um, due to droughts, which is certainly a very, very low number. And uh, I, I would say this is not necessarily because droughts do not displace people, but because it's harder for the IDMC to, to really capture those displacements because they are not related necessarily to, a, to an immediate event to which you can connect the displacements that occur to, um, but they are gr more gradual processes that can also um, unfold over, over years um, and also lead to um, migration displacement then. Um, over a longer time horizon. Generally, when we are not talking about displacement, but about migration, so basically people um, moving to, to other regions or other countries, um, the picture gets a little bit more difficult. Here I have brought you a map um, showing the annual net migration rates um, averaged over 2015 to 2020, and that is uh, measuring per 1,000 uh, people. Um, so the general challenge is that whereas with displacements, you can clearly um, link, or often in many cases, you, you have a clearer link between, um, um, between an environmental event and a mobility outcome. It is not so clear when you look at the general migration patterns of people, um, especially not when you look at uh, singular countries, for example. Why is that? Because it's hard to determine what the reasons, the underlying reasons were, why um, people were, uh, were migrating away from, from, a, from a region or a country. Um, typically what we do is then we um, look basically at the entire world and look at um, whether overall on average we see relationships between changes in, um, in livelihoods, in, in environmental conditions, climatic conditions, 
and whether these um, affect over time uh, mobility patterns, but it's very hard to basically pin this down for a single country. One really can just look at this uh, in, a, in a larger aggregate. Nevertheless, there has been, despite these difficulties, some attempts been made in the literature to basically uh, pin down um, the number of environmental migrants, climate migrants, um, with, with, with more accurate estimates. I've given you here an overview of different estimates that have been made uh, in the past years that typically um, where you have predictions until the year 2050, that is the last column here to the right, uh, ranging in, in, in a range of, of several hundred million uh, people that are expected to be displaced uh, due to environmental change processes. Here, I would just like to say that all of these numbers, they rest on a lot of assumptions. So one has to be extremely careful when basically taking these, these numbers. They should uh, not be taken at face value, but just given giving an, an indication of, of, of where we, we might uh, move uh, in terms of uh, migration in the, in the future, but they also involve a substantive uncertainty. One uh, projection that has received quite a bit of attention in the past years is uh, the projections done by the Groundswell report. That is a report that was uh, issued by the World Bank, but now there is a, a second report out, um, a second part out um, that basically extended the first one this report that has mainly focused on um, internal migration, they also came to the conclusion that as many as 260 million people um, could be forced to move within their own countries due to slow onset, mainly climate change impacts by 2050. So what I would like to, you to take away from that is that on one side, we have um, um, a lot of uncertainty when it comes to these uh, projections of future impacts on migration. But at the same time, we see that these, this topic is quite of relevance for a substantive number of, of, of people globally. So it's not a minor issue at the end of the day. And again, as I said before, it's, it's less of, of, of a challenge um, for, 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 for the wealthy countries, but rather really for a challenge of the country, for the countries where the people are, um, are migrating, um, especially um, for um, both communities from where they migrate away um, but also for um, areas where they might be going to. So that is really something where policy measures are needed to prepare those destination areas and to um, accommodate and also integrate uh, migrants in the future. And before coming to an end, I would just briefly like to once more highlight the diversity and complexity that is in um, this climate-related, uh, uh, yeah, I've written immobility topic that is inherent in this topic. Um, here again, I have brought you an example from Peru, from the research of my colleague, where you can see that uh, basically migration and mobility more generally, um, they are used for, for also different causes depending on the different uh, livelihood conditions people face. Um, again, there is not one form of, of climate mobility that we observe. We see, um, but still we see that multiple groups and communities are using migration as a livelihood and potentially also as an adaptation strategy, um, ranging from fishermen at the coastline to farmers in the highlands um, to farmers in the rainforest. But as you see, with very different and uh, diverse um, um, uh, forms, in very different and diverse forms. Migration is not always a linear process, and this is also true for climate mobility. Um, Often what we see is that people show some circular migration patterns, that is that they, for example, migrate from a region A to a region B and then return to region A. What we also see is that they then continue to region C and return to region B and so on. So there is a lot of um, movement going on. Um, this is also for you to basically um, make you aware that this is not just a, um, an origin uh, sending to, to, to receiving area, but it's, it's more complex. There's really different migration trajectories. People take different routes and so on. Um, all of these processes are also closely embedded in generally sustainable development and uh, processes and generally other population dynamics that are closely linked to these mobility outcomes that we observe. What I also want to highlight here is when we talk about research on climate change and migration mobilities, then we're not only interested in how environmental hazards affect out-migration from a region A, 
but we're really interested in the entire spectrum of the mobility process and up to the, um, 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 the, the prospective destination areas. So what we see, for example, today is that uh, many migrants are moving into, into cities where they are then um, facing other environmental challenges, maybe different ones that they have seen in their previous uh, regions of origin, but that can still be very devastating for their livelihoods. For example, we see that flooding is a major issue um, in, in many cities, for example, in Africa, um, where people who are forced to live in informal settlements are the ones that are um, primarily affected. Um, and this can, in the worst case, also lead to something what we call secondary people who were once displaced are displaced again and potentially again. What is also important is when we're talking about this topic is that, of course, not everyone who is affected by an environmental change or hazard migrates. There is really a large number of people in communities um, that, that stay in place. Um, and this has to do with a number of other factors, um, ranging from the question how severely affected households are. So we discussed about this at the very beginning that um, um, when you remember about this uh, diagram that I've shown you from the IPCC, that basically risk is a combination of uh, exposure to a an hazard and, uh, and, and vulnerability. So the question is how severely affected are uh, groups of populations? Do they have potentially any other ways to adapt to changes in situ, so locally? And also the questions, are there sufficient resources to migrate for them? So in and this is, a, is, a, is, a, is another very hot topic currently in the literature, um, we see that, uh, that some groups um, are simply not able to migrate or to leave affected areas, um, hazardous areas, because um, they are lacking uh, sufficient resources to, for example, build up a life elsewhere. And these populations who we refer to as trapped populations, so trapped because they cannot escape the environmental hazard, they are, of course, characterized by a very, very high uh, vulnerability and uh, face very dire conditions and deserve also a special attention. Um, in some cases, and I just wanted to highlight that here as well, people also don't have a motivation in many cases to move. Um, in, often in, in migration research, one has this uh, uh, very deterministic uh, perception that if something happens, if there's a hazard occurring, uh, then people will automatically start migrating. But this is completely um, disconnected from the actual reality that many people are facing, where they, of course, also have strong incentives to stay and to remain in the in the home regions um, and uh, also uh, in, in a region where they have social networks and, uh, and, and the cultural heritage. So, as I said before, differences in vulnerability and, and exposure, they play an important role when we look at... Uh, mobility outcomes um, um, as a result of, of environmental stresses. And here, non-climatic factors um, that result from, from non-climatic factors um, um, play an important role. This can be inequalities, that can be poverty, that can be um, limited access to, to health uh, services in an area. They can all shape whether a population is, is vulnerable or not. Um, and can affect basically how severely the population is affected by a climatic impact. Um, often it is the poorest ones that are worst affected. This you see here at the bottom part of this graph that have the highest levels of vulnerability. And those are also the ones that are most easily um, getting trapped um, if uh, confronted with a, with, with a, with a hazardous situation. Um, we have actually done a, a number of studies now where we could show really that it is mainly populations with a middle income, so middle income groups, not the very wealthy ones in a community, not the very poor ones, but more the ones in the middle income range, um, middle wealth range that, that then respond to, to environmental hazards by changing their migration behaviors. Just to summarize this here, so there's multiple responses how households and communities can respond to environmental stresses. There is no determinism in play when it comes to uh, climate change, environmental change, and mobility outcomes. So people can either 
migrate on one side, then the question is, did they migrate uh, because it was a voluntary decision or did they move because they were forcefully displaced? Or they can, and this is often the larger group, remain in place, mobile. Then the question is, haven't they, they been affected? Do they have my, no, no incentives to migrate or a strong incentive to, to remain in their origin areas? Or are they actually trapped populations um, that have no abilities, no capabilities to leave the affected areas? And you see, it's really a very broad set of different um, different groups and uh, that, that, that opens up the complexity of this whole topic that also requires um, holistic policy responses that basically address um, all of these different groups in an appropriate way. And this is the last point I want to talk about, um, implications and, and policy measures. Um, so complexity requires holistic, interconnected, and as I've said, human-centered interventions and policies that address uh, different levels. So how can we basically help people who are affected by climate change? How can we help migrants displaced who are forced to leave their homes? Initially, the first step is of course, uh, by investing in climate protection and avoiding in the first place that um, future climate impacts occur. So that is all what falls under the umbrella of mitigation. So that's of course very important. We should not forget that with this, we have a very strong um, impact on um, basically the future and the livelihoods of people in many parts of the world. The, at the same time, it's also important to invest into improving the abilities to adapt to changing climatic and environmental conditions in different parts of the world. So adaptation, especially since we know that many of the climate impacts uh, that have already begun to affect us, um, they are going to get worse in the next years and decades, irrespective of how we, how we change um, our consumption, our production behavior, simply because we have already emitted uh, so many emissions, so much emissions, that, uh, that, that basically uh, the climate will, will still change uh, for, the, for the next couple of, of decades. So adaptation is really key and support of communities is really important here. Household vulnerability, working on vulnerability to limit the harmful effects of climate change is another aspect. Then if it really comes to migration, it's important that we create legal and political frameworks that allow us both to protect migrants, but also those populations that remain immobile. And finally, um, it is important to, in this whole discussion, to not forget uh, the destination areas, um, to prepare them um, to allow for smooth integration of migrants. And this preparation is, of course, not only um, addressing the destination areas, but can already start in, in the origin areas of migrants, for example, by, um, by enhancing um, skill sets of, of, of potential migrants in the future, by, by um, giving them um, education and training that allows them then to successfully integrate into labor markets in the prospective urban destinations where they might migrate into the future. So before coming to an end, just here I have summarized some of the points that I've just mentioned and that I think are quite important related to improving adaptive capacities and resilience. And I would invite you to read those after, um, after uh, the presentation, um, once you have uh, received the slides. I've also given you here a summary of achievements in terms of legal and political recognition of the topic climate migration displacement, but also highlighting that there's still a long way to go um, to fill up basically the gaps in legal and policy frameworks to truly protect environmental and climate migrants worldwide. And finally, I have uh, given you a link here to one of our recent briefs where we looked at uh, some of these links between environmental and climate systems migration and urbanization processes, which I personally think um, is very important. And I would also here invite you to take a closer look at it, um, also to see basically how this, um, um, how these uh, different relationships come into play and why they matter. And um, just as a last slide with content, um, why it matters, I have brought you here. Um, um, cities are really um, strongly affected by, um, by migration moves, internal migration moves primarily that we see all over the world. We have seen really an incredible population growth in many urban areas 
And this is expected to continue in the next uh, years and decades to come. And I've brought you here a, a, a graph um, that was prepared by the Financial Times based on uh, UN population prospect data, where they have uh, shown for the different world regions how cities are expected to grow. And uh, the size of the bubbles is uh, indicating the current size of the cities. So you see that we have already like cities that host quite a few million people and those cities and especially in Africa expected to grow substantially in the period up to the next 10 years, 15 years. So from 2018 to 35, some of these cities are, are expected to double in size to more than double in size in the next 10 to 15 years. Cities like Abuja, Dar es Salaam or Kampala. So cities that already today have several million inhabitants. And you can only imagine what that meant um, for his, what that means for a city to, to basically grow so rapidly um, in size. Um, you can imagine a Berlin, it, what happened if it were to grow suddenly from, from its a bit more than 3 million inhabitants to, to, to double the size. So that has really major implications for cities and there's an urgent need um, to, to prepare and uh, make investments into infrastructure and also inclusive um, um, inclusive uh, efforts um, that allow also the people who will arrive in the future to find a good life there. And with this, I would like to end with some last take-home messages just to wrap up. Um, as I said, climate mobility is not a new phenomenon, but something that has uh, been around uh, throughout human history. It is a highly complex and nonlinear phenomena. It has multiple con causes and is highly context-dependent um, the climate environment can influence mobility both directly and indirectly. Migration itself is only one of several potential adaptation strategies households can use. Mobility usually occurs within national boundaries. So we see in rare cases that people are moving beyond those. And finally, just to remind ourselves, migrants and displaced are a highly vulnerable group and in need of special protection. So we need to really take a close, closer look at, at, at the people who are affected by, by, by climate change and, of course, also consider those people who stay behind or, in the worst case, and cannot move away from affected areas. And now, with this, I really stop and I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>